The Dead Sea Scrolls, Dr. James D. Tabor unravels them and discusses his historical experience with dealing with the scrolls himself. When I was working on my doctorate and then the first decade or two of teaching, I was just in libraries. That's how you do research. I think I made one trip to the land of Israel or the Holy Land, uh, just like a tourist or you know, wanting to look it over, but I wasn't working over there. And what really drew me was the idea of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, just imagine ancient books over 2,000 years old, hidden in caves in the Judean desert. And, you know, I work on Jesus. But did you, have you ever thought, you open up Mark 1, earliest gospel, where's the main guy just as you start the main story. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. Now, a lot of people think that's just, oh, he's out in the desert somewhere. In the text, it talks about the Aravah. That's a specific desert. Isaiah mentions it. And he says, I'm out fulfilling Isaiah. I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. So Aravah is a geographical location. It's the Dead Sea Valley, that desert. So he's actually out there. So right away you're connected to Jesus. And then he says the time is fulfilled and then Jesus comes along and gets baptized and so forth. So I knew something about the scrolls, but to go to that desert, I'm telling you, and to be where they were found, they were found in 1947. I started going in 1991 or two to the desert. And it's just, just drawn me like a magnet. I've probably been back, uh, 80 to 100 times. I've never been to the Holy Land or Israel or Palestine without going to the desert. I've stayed in the desert for over a month before, right at Qumran in a kibbutz there. And you begin to feel it like at night, the stars and so forth. I don't know how many people know it's the lowest spot on earth. It's just such a special place. And why was this group there? I got intrigued with it, the caves. I spent countless hours walking up and down those caves. The first caves I went to were the caves where Dead Sea Scrolls were found. I'll never forget the time I found Cave One. That's the one discovered by the Bedouin shepherds by accident. They threw a rock and it has a kind of upper hole. Now when you go, it's been opened up because the archeologists came and took everything out. But back in 1947, it was just a lucky chance. You throw a rock in a cave thinking maybe there's treasure in there. And they heard they were disappointed, broken pottery. And then they thought, well, maybe. So they went in there. And literally, it's just like uh, a kind of a mystery story out of, uh, you know, Aladdin or something. You, you go into a cave and there could be something there. You picture candlelight and so forth. And there was... Ten jars in that cave. It changed history, but nine of them were empty. One of them had seven scrolls in it. This is just amazing. One of the seven was a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. You know, our oldest copy of Isaiah at that time was 1000 CE or AD. Once this was dated, it's a thousand years earlier, even more than a thousand years earlier. It's back before the time of Jesus. And as we're finally talking about books and scrolls and physical objects that were around in the time of Jesus. I work on early Christianity. So John the Baptist is out in that area. After Jesus is baptized, I don't know if you recall, what does he do immediately? He goes out into the wilderness, that same wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights like Moses and like Elijah. So that desert experience just fired me up from the start. But then I started working there officially, meaning going on expeditions, excavating, doing projects there, and also studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I've been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls for 30 years. One of the things in this course that's just really amazing is we're going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls that weren't even available 
until the 1990s when they were finally released. Remember, initially they're, they're discovered in 1947, and 40% of them still had not been released to scholars even, much less the public. And I got in right on the heyday of this discovery. So for me, to even read a scroll in a photograph, which I was finally able to obtain some of the original photographs through Robert Eisenman, who got hold of them, and he shared them with me. That was exciting as finding them in a cave because no one had ever seen them except a small group of scholars, and they divided them all up, and different scholars took different scrolls. But other scholars like me or Eisenman, uh, Herschel Shanks of Bar Magazine was a big campaigner. Where are the scrolls? 40% are not even out. What's in them? Is there something to hide? And there are all kinds of conspiracy theories. But I'll never forget, I got the photograph of one. We, we number them. 4Q, that means Cave 4, Q Qumran. Qumran's the settlement where the group lived. And, it's, and then it's numbered 521. Guess what 4Q 521 is? I published it with Michael Weiss. First time ever it was seen in the public and BAR, Biblical Archaeology Review, later in an academic publication. You know what the first line says? The heavens and the earth will obey his Messiah. Now, normally you think uh, Messiah would be a guy walking around and he's Davidic and he's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and be king. All of a sudden we have a cosmic Messiah talked about. Well, I work on early Christianity. And this idea that the Messiah would go to the heavens and rule was a new idea. Uh, not for Christians, but, you know, when did Jews take this up? And now we learn that this is pre-Christian. As I began to read it and translate it, it also says the Messiah will heal the sick, preach good news to the poor, that's the word gospel, right? And raise the dead. And I remembered the passage in our gospel. It's in the Gospel of Luke. It's part of the Q source or the two source theory. When John the Baptist asked Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? Because he's in prison. And one of the things that says that the anointed of the Spirit will do, which Jesus claimed to be the one anointed of the Spirit, Isaiah 61, he's going to make the captives go free. John's in prison, right? Then it goes on to say, in this scroll, that he will raise the dead. That's exactly what Jesus said when he was asked by John's disciples. You know, are you going to do it or not? He said, go tell John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel. So I'm not saying he read that scroll and tried to like, copy it or something, but he's reflecting a kind of messianism that we find in the scrolls, and there are countless examples of that. If I told you this, and you'd never heard of the scrolls, and I said, what if there was a group out in the wilderness preparing the way of the Lord? They call themselves the people of the new covenant. They were apocalyptic. They thought they were in the last days. The time is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. They began to share their goods in common. They told their followers, sell what you have and give to the poor, and let's band together. They were preaching and teaching a message of judgment. They also baptized, that's the Christian word, dipped in immersion, not for Jewish rites of ritual cleansing, but to initiate you into the movement. I mean, I have to be talking about the John the Baptist Jesus movement, except I'm not. Yes, John the Baptist and Jesus did those things. New covenant, preaching in the wilderness and so forth, baptism in the River Jordan, a hundred years after the Dead Sea School. So one of the things in this course that we look at, not who came first, the Dead Sea group came first. People call them the Essenes. That's fine with me. I, don't, I would rather call them what they call themselves, people of the way the new covenanters, the yakad, that means the, the church, basically, the assembly. They're a brotherhood, and they're banding together a hundred years before Jesus, preaching the same kind of message. 
that we later get in the New Testament. So when the scrolls were discovered, it was kind of, to many people, a bit threatening because it's like, well, let's see, there was this group we never heard of because people say, well, we heard of the Essenes, but the Essenes described in Josephus don't even sound like this group. He never says they're the people of the new covenant. They're preparing the way in the wilderness. He doesn't mention any of that. He makes them like a Greek philosophical group because he wants to impress the emperor and his Roman friends and say, oh, we Jews, hey, we have Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes. But now that we have the scrolls, we know what they really believed. Are they a precursor of what we call the Jesus movement? I don't think it's so much that the Jesus followers and John the Baptist like copied the group, but I think they're part of that same stream of Judaism. They're definitely not Pharisees. I think everyone would agree with that. Definitely not Sadducees, who didn't even believe in life after death or resurrection. So here they are believing a set of a dozen doctrines that we associate uniquely with Christianity, but they were practicing these a hundred years before. What I want to do in this course is have people read the scrolls. Years ago, when these scrolls were released, these unpublished scrolls, I remember I spoke to a crowd at a Jewish synagogue, standing room only. They had to open up the doors and put in more chairs. It was over 500 people. And I started telling them the excitement of, of this new material that we had. And afterwards this, afterwards, this very kind old lady came up, Jewish woman, and she said, Dr. Taver, I'm so glad we finally have the scrolls. And I said, oh, I am too. It's so exciting. And I said, have you read them yet? She goes, well, I haven't really read them, but I'm really happy we have them. And I think that's where a lot of people are. They've heard of the scrolls. I think it's amazing. We have these books that are ancient, a thousand years older than our current copies of the Bible. But uh, what do they say? So in this course, you know what we do? We read the scrolls. English translation, of course. And we go through all the main scrolls. So it's actually a thorough class in which we delve into the scrolls. I don't just lecture you and tell you what they are. I literally have the scrolls out, not the rolled out scrolls, but a printed book. And I say, now notice in column one, line two, what is this? And I point out, you know, we're, this is the time for preparing the way in the wilderness. And we're reading a text that was written 150 years before Jesus said, this is the time for preparing the way in the wilderness. What we're doing is we're uncovering the real background of early Christianity. People say, well, the background of Christianity and Jesus is Judaism. Judaism? Judaism is very, very diverse. You know, the background of early Christianity is the Dead Sea Scrolls. And yet, many, many Christians who are very interested in Jesus, also Jews who are interested in their Judaism, don't really realize or don't take the time or don't even have the opportunity to read the scrolls themselves and see what kind of movement this was. It's, it's just amazing. And there's so many things that we do in the course that are done in a classroom, in a university, or in a college, in an in-depth course. We really dive in. It's got 10 lessons. And by the time you finish the 10th lesson, you know, you're kind of a mini scroll expert. I mean, you really have read the scrolls. And it's just surprise after surprise. Uh, I can't wait to share it with students. And one of the things we're going to do, this is unique, I think. Uh, we're going to have Zoom meetings. And I don't mean a webinar where people come and I talk and give another lecture. That's, you know, they're doing that when they see the course. No, they come and we gather everybody around that is, you know, taking the course. And then we start talking together and answering questions and responding. And, you know, it's just like in the university when I teach my classes. I know all professors say this, but I'm telling you it's true. I sometimes learn as much from my students as I do from my teachers at Chicago or the graduate schools I went to. Because they're coming at it new and they say, well, what is... What, what is this phrase and what is that and why does it say this and that? 
And so uh, I, I do this, I, I absolutely enjoy it. And to see people that have studied the Bible, whether they're Jews or Christians or even secular, everybody's interested in ancient manuscripts. Everybody's interested in old caves that hold treasures. And in this case, the treasures are just astounding. Uh, just imagine unrolling a scroll and reading something that hasn't been looked at in 2,000 years. It's, it's amazing. One of the things I'm going to reveal in the course, and you know, I'm going to be mysterious here, but I did make a major archaeological discovery while I was at Qumran excavating and surveying and trying to figure out what was what. I've excavated there three different times, and I made a discovery. Now, i tell you what it wasn't. It wasn't a jar full of scrolls. It wasn't a coin on the ground. I've done that many times at seven different excavations all over the country. At Qumran, that's where the Dead Sea Scroll community lived. I started thinking about where something might be. I literally paced it off and mapped it out using the scrolls. And I found the place I was looking for. I got an anthropologist, I won't say his name now, but it's all revealed in the course. Uh, just trying to tantalize you a little bit here. And we confirmed scientifically that I was right. And it has to do with one of the most important things in the lives of this community. It has to do with a certain kind of holiness that they followed. And we weren't really sure what it was or how they would work all this out. Uh, but it has to do with observing the Torah, and we figured it out. So there's a mystery for you.